Thanks, Daniel. Hi. I'm excited to talk about our recent work on lightweight sublinear arguments without a trusted setup. This is joint work with uh, Karmit Hazai from bar -Ilan and Yuval from uh, UCLA and Technion, and my student, uh, Scott Ames. Well, this work is going to be, in general, applicable to arguments, uh, something similar to what uh, you heard in the previous talk. What we, in fact, construct in this work is a lightweight sublinear zero knowledge. And that's why Lehero. Now, what do we do? Well, we take things that are long and complex, like for instance, things that Daniel cannot pronounce, and we make it simple and short. So, uh, what is this talk about? This talk is about uh, zero knowledge proofs. Um, I don't think zero knowledge proofs deserves an in introduction here, but anyways, let me just quickly go over it. Go over it. So, a zero knowledge proof. Uh, helps one entity called the prover to convince a verifier of the validity of a statement and nothing more. Relevant to blockchains these days, we know there are uh, cryptocurrencies such as Zcash that employ uh, zero-knowledge proofs. How does one formalize it? You create a proof system and you argue completeness, which says that uh, there is a mechanism for a prover to convince a true statement to a verifier. No bad prover should be able to convince a verifier of a false statement. And finally, the interesting property of zero knowledge, which says that your proof carries nothing more than the validity of the statement. Formalized by a, a simulation paradigm, it sort of is a central cryptographic primitive, and I don't need to say anything more about this. Uh, what's more relevant here, at least in this work, is a variant of zero knowledge proofs, which is non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, which restricts sort of the prover to send a single message from the prover to the verifier. This is slightly different, again, from the previous talk where interaction was uh, allowed. So more generally, let's talk about taxonomy of there are different flavors of proofs. Um, if you think about it, a proof can be for just deterministic computation, P versus uh, NP. The previous talk you saw was specifically for deterministic computation. Um, but NP is typically more desirable, especially in zero knowledge. Um, interactive versus non-interactive. Non-interactive is typically preferable in applications, blockchain signatures that you would have seen in the previous uh, uh, session. Another distinction I'm going to make, which is uh, trusted setup versus no setup, which I'll talk about a little bit later, there are some zero-knowledge proof systems that require a trusted setup, which essentially means you want some sort of a trusted entity or a trusted process that can sample some public parameters of uh, your uh, crypto system. And then another uh, distinction is zero knowledge versus only soundness. In applications like in the previous uh, talk, where only integrity of a computation is required, soundness is typically sufficient. But uh, in applications where you also want privacy, you typically want uh, zero knowledge. Then succinct versus non-succinct, you typically want your communication or your proof length. You want your uh, proofs to be short, especially in applications of blockchains and uh, even signatures. And a last distinction I want to make here is uh, versus the kind of crypto machinery that's used. Uh, if you look at the constructions that are both like varieties that use only symmetric key cryptography versus things that additionally require public key crypto. And I make this distinction sort of for two reasons. One, you can think of efficiency where public key primitives, at least the ones that are practically used, are orders of magnitude um, uh, more expensive, at least computationally, compared to symmetric uh, uh, objects. And also, I mean, if... Uh, post-quantum security is something that you care about. The ones that you use in practice, at least the public key variants, are not quantum resistant. Now, here is another way of classifying prior work. There's plenty, plenty of work that's been done both in the theory space and in the practical space for uh, zero-knowledge proofs. Here is sort of a classification based on the underlying combinatorial uh, machinery that's used in these construction. In fact, all of these, you can think of the following blueprint that sort of takes a, a combinatorial object, puts some crypto into it, and makes it sort of a proof with desired properties. Now, the, the first variant, which sort of uses a central uh, combinatorial object from complexity theory, uh, this has been used to develop many just like many arguments as well as zero knowledge uh, uh, arguments. The kind of constructions in this space 
don't uh, require any trusted setup, but they are not yet practical. And I want to say there's a lot of work, a lot of progress is being done here, but uh, it's still not yet uh, practical. The second one, which is the more popular variant, which is a slightly less complex than the first one uh, in terms of the combinatorial object, but sort of uses heavy cryptography. Like it uses, uh, in, in specifically, it uses heavy public key cryptography. It has benefits of short proofs and fast verification, but it uses pub public key crypto, which is typically quantum insecure. And many of these constructions require, in fact, even the ones that I was talking to you about Zcash, you require a trusted setup. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. But uh, uh, this is the state of affairs with uh, these kind of constructions. And historically, if you've heard the words snarks or zero knowledge snarks, it came from these line of uh, uh, works. And finally, this is also a more recent uh, development, uh, is to in use information theoretic multi-party computation to, uh, to uh, design zero knowledge proofs. Uh, if you had attended the previous session in this room, uh, the first uh, talk was about using one such approach, improving and optimizing one such approach uh, in the space to construct uh, zero knowledge proofs. And No, ah, okay, so forget if there are some color issues in my slides, I'm a little colorblind, but I sort of try to make the distinction of what is theory and practice. It's not about what is, uh, uh, it's not matching the red versus, yeah, yeah, and what have sort of implementations, and again, maybe I might have messed up a little bit here, I apologize for, uh, for that. Anyways, the last category, uh, it does not require setup, it has good uh, performance in terms of prover, but, uh, and it's post-quantum, but the thing is everything is linear, including the proof length, which sort of scales linearly in the statement that you want to prove. Uh, what is our main result? Our main result is that we get a non-interactive, succinct argument without a trusted setup. Uh, it's simple, it's concretely efficient, it uses only symmetric key crypto, and it's post-quantum secure if that's something that you care about. Um, Sort of, I want to point out that this is sort of the first work that combines the good features that we want in terms of sublinearity, NP, avoiding these complex combinatorial objects and uh, public key cryptography. A little more concretely, if my slide will move, okay. Um, for what is the parameters, I just want to talk a little bit about the concrete efficiency of our work. Uh, for 40-bit security, the proof length that we achieve, it's sublinear uh, in the sense that we get square root, the statement size or the circuit size that you want to prove your zero knowledge. So it's roughly half the square root number of gates, kilobytes. Now, if for getting a non-interactive zero knowledge, you'll have to instantiate our work with 80-bit security. Um, a rough calculation, or if you want a crude upper bound, the complexity will be twice, but you can actually optimize and you can show that the overhead of getting 80-bit would be square root two times the 40-bit uh, the uh, case. And these are actually the ones that are relevant, in fact, even for blockchain and Bitcoin applications and are referred to as zero, like it was, this, this work is uh, in progress uh, of Eli Bensason et al. And they coined this word of zero knowledge stark to distinguish it from zero knowledge snarks where there is no trusted setup, where the T stands for transparent. And our work can handle both uh, Boolean and uh, arithmetic circuits. Different applications require uh, different things, and uh, applications typically do involve, there are applications where you want arithmetic circuits and versus Boolean circuits. And finally, a little, a small word about uh, our, the, the computational efficiency of the prover and verifier. The heaviest part of our computation is basically computing a Merkle tree. This is for committing something that's long of roughly, let's say, square root C leaf elements. And the other part is applying FFTs, like many, many FFTs, but of size square root C. This I want to sort of contrast with several of the previous works. FFT is something that many of these zero knowledge proof systems do use, even like just uh, uh, SNARGs use. Uh, fast Fourier transform, but they typically require very long, like applying FFT on a very large domain, like roughly the size of the circuit. What we do is we sort of make it short and do many, many uh, FFTs of this, and this sort of gi does give us better efficiency. All right, so just coming back to our taxonomy, what we achieve is all the things here in green. 
I'm cheating a little bit. When typically people refer to saying succinct, they want something very short. What we get is I call somewhat succinct, but I will show you some numbers in a second. For even small circuits, this, in fact, is uh, uh, quite reasonable. And often, if you've seen in practice, uh, things that vary square root are better than things that are uh, polylog. And again, going to this figure, just to reiterate, we sort of get the best features of uh, all these three uh, uh, approaches. And I want to say, morally, our, our work sort of lies in the space of multi-party computation. You will see that the techniques uh, came from this area. But there is a way to view ours as being in a variant of the first category. And if I have time at the end, I'll tell a little bit about it. All right, so a small word about uh, the trusted setup that is sort of the zero knowledge that's used in uh, Zcash. They do, they have made effort in sort of how to mitigate threats that come from uh, trusted setups. They had sort of a ceremony for the initiation. They did some videotaping of uh, things happening. Uh, I just want to say that, especially to our community, also more in general, uh, one should be wary of, uh, you know, such approaches. I mean, the integrity of such a thing uh, is often uh, questionable. All right. So uh, a quick uh, slide about our uh, numbers. I'm, um, the first column is like things that have been like done, uh, which are used in practice. I don't have concrete numbers, but I want to sort of point out that the communication time and the verification time, let's say for proving in zero knowledge of uh, a SHA certificate, they are, the communication is super good and the verification is good for linear PCPs, but the prover time is in fact quite expensive. A lot of work has made progress and if I'm reporting minutes instead of seconds, I am, uh, I'm sorry, I, this is the best I could sort of find out from uh, the space for the SHA certificate. ZKBOO and ZKB++, this follows under the third category of uh, the multi-party computation and also the work that you saw in the previous session uh, on post-quantum signatures uh, is the optimized variant in this work. They actually get very good prover and verification time, but uh, their proof lengths are long, and in fact, they also scale linearly in the uh, circuit size. And our work, we get like reasonable proof length. Our prover and verification time are not expensive, and our scaling is, is good. We don't require trusted setup. Again, I want to say that don't uh, read too much into the slide in that we didn't do apples to apples comparison here. They were not run on the same machine. But if you think about running on commodity hardware, this is sort of a reasonable way of looking at uh, things. This was run on a reasonable uh, laptop. That's the numbers that we have produced. And I also think the ZKBOO numbers are similar to that uh, uh, similar flavor. Finally, I want to point out uh, the last uh, row over here, which refers to amortization. Imagine that you want to prove several instances of the same theorem, just like in the previous work, where they said many copies of the same computation. In this space, we are able to do, um, the benefit we get in our approach is that we have a variant that can do amortization, where our verification is also sublinear in the computation. For a single instance setting, in fact, our verification is, it varies linearly with, let's say, the circuit size of the statement. But if you want to do many, many copies, ours becomes, and our proof length also varies sort of linearly in the number of instances and the circuit size. It's, uh, that's what, that's the benefit we get in our amortization. Just a point uh, in the implementation space, we can show that we can verify roughly 2,000 instances of the, the SHA certificate in the same time we can verify a single instance. So uh, we get like a really good benefit if we have to run this in typical uh, zero knowledge statements that come in cryptocurrencies and blockchains, you want to do many, many computations of SHA. All right, so let me, uh, this is regarding our work and uh, uh, a quick uh, view of our performance. What I want to do next is I sort of want to show the simplicity of our zero knowledge and I want to give you a proof schematic of how our approach works. All right, so what we want to do, we want to prove a zero knowledge for circuit SAT. Let's say that we have a circuit and we want to show that we have a witness W that evaluates to one under the circuit. Let's assign wire values that make it uh, uh, output one. The first step in our uh, zero knowledge proof system is to take these wire values that we have in this evaluation and sort of arrange it in a matrix, okay? 
and each value here is going to be repeated maybe some constant number of times uh, in this matrix. Uh, let's say that you, our zero knowledge system provides flexibility in that we can arrange this for any, like you can arrange it in any sort of a block matrix. You have the flexibility of choosing uh, A and B. It's only the contents that uh, uh, are going to translate from here. To be a little more precise, the number of uh, values that we have to represent in the matrix is roughly some constant times the number of gates. We provide two variants. If your circuit is sort of a Boolean circuit like what I have shown here, then X is two, the number of like each, you should think of each color here will repeat twice in the matrix. And again, we don't even need to care about in what order these things are done. This is for the Boolean uh, circuit. But if you want to think more generally arithmetic circuits, X is three and the benefit here is that while the constant becomes three, we only need to count the number of AND gates. In other words, XOR comes for free when you want to treat the uh, arithmetic variant. So depending on your application, you can choose uh, any one of these uh, to do this. And again, as I mentioned, there is a flexibility in our system that you can decide uh, A and B as long as it satisfies A times B is uh, covers all the colors. All right, so what is our proof system? The prover with the witness does constructs this matrix, and then the prover is going to encode every row in this matrix using an error correcting code. Okay, this error correcting code is going to have some decent properties. For people who know, this is going to be some form of an interleaved Reed Solomon code, and the expansion is going to be constant. Now, the prover is going to commit to this encoded matrix. How is the prover going to commit? The prover is going to use a Merkle tree. And the leaves of this Merkle tree are going to be the columns of this uh, encoded matrix. And this is, I'm going to give you an interactive zero knowledge proof, but if you apply the classic fiat shimmy transform, you can make this non-interactive. So I'm just going to give you the proof schematic. The prover commits to the root of this uh, uh, matrix. Now the verifier challenges with a random string, which is basically a sequence of, imagine, random elements in a finite field. The prover is going to respond, is going to interpret this matrix as their encodings row wise and compute, just imagine that you're just going to compute some random linear combination of these rows and is going to give something that is of length one row. Okay, you're going to imagine that you're just doing a weighted sum using the multipliers, the field elements provided by the verifier. This is a reasonable approximation of what happens. And then the verifier is going to challenge the prover and ask to open some of the columns in this uh, encoded matrix, and that's what the prover is going to provide. The prover is going to give the columns that the verifier requested. The number of columns is going to be proportional to sort of the security parameter that you want, and also give the Merkle decommitments. So this is our proof system. Now, how do we look at the measure, of the, measure the performance of our system? Well, our proof length essentially is going to be one row, which is sort of order B, and the number of columns, and I said the number of columns, you can approximate it as security parameter, which is 40 or 80, whatever you want, times the number of columns, uh, the, the number of rows. Okay, so it's order B plus kappa times A, and if you have, as I said, it's going to be a constant number of the wire values. If you choose A and B to be roughly order square root C, you're going to get uh, the complexity that I mentioned. And uh, a word about the computation, I said that what we do is many, many FFTs. You can see here, to do a Reed solomon encoding of each row of this matrix is going to essentially involve an FFT computation of length B, which is square root C, and the number of FFT computations are going to be the number of uh, rows in this matrix. All right, so a very, very high le level overview of the uh, techniques that we use uh, uh, in this work. As I said, like I, I sort of gave you a proof schematic of how our proof works, but you can one can view this proof system as being uh, compiled via the MPC in the head approach of uh, Ishai et al. And just a, a word about this: this helps you transform honest majority multiparty computations to uh, a zero knowledge uh, a zero knowledge proof system, similar to the work of the post quantum signatures that you saw in the uh, in the previous session. And a quick word about this is that if you know multi-party computation, this approach works as follows. The prover in her head does a multi-party, emulates a multi-party computation of 
the uh, NP uh, relation, and then commit to the views of the different players. The verifier challenges asks to open a few of the views. The prover reveals this, and the verifier checks for consistency. So this is sort of the high-level approach of MPC, and you can see that the flavors of this were in our uh, proof schematic. And as I pointed, the, um, the work from the previous session is sort of an optimized variant of one of these approaches applied to a specific uh, uh, multi-party computation. Now, as I said, OK, we are also going to do the same approach, but there is a problem. For people who know about this uh, literature, typically multi-party computation protocols, the communication complexity is proportional to the circuit size. And how are we even going to get something that is sublinear in this? OK, so and the key insight that we have over here is that the per-party view size of an MPC protocol, you can construct MPC where the view size of each party is going to be sublinear. And if you're not going to open too many of these, the overall communication complexity becomes square root the circuit size. So by using uh, MPC protocols, even though the total communication could be proportional to the circuit size, the per view cost can be sublinear, and we can optimize this to get something, to get a sublinear zero knowledge proof. So roughly speaking, our contributions in this space, like using this approach, is to say that we take, the, we take this I-cost transformation of MPC to, Z, to ZK. We optimize it in terms of the number of views that we have to open. This is more like inspired from the work of uh, uh, Ishai Prabhakaran and Sahai. And then we also optimize the honest majority MPC. In, in some sense, we weaken the guarantees of this required, and that gives us better performance. And finally, we do have an implementation that I'll talk about uh, for uh, another minute. And as I pointed, as I mentioned, morally it's a multi-party computation, but one can think of this transformation as constructing a variant of PCP referred to as interactive PCPs of uh, Kalai and Raz, and then compiling with the work of Ben Sasson et al. to get uh, a zero-knowledge proof. So technically, you can think of this as a variant of constructing a sublinear interactive PCP that is simple and concretely efficient. All right, a little bit about our implementation. So I'm going to give you uh, the graphs for a single instance and a multi-instance variant. This is giving the communication cost versus uh, the number of gates in the circuit. It's a log-log plot. And I'm comparing the cost of our proof system. There are actually two lines that are going across the screen. The, the, the top line across the screen uh, is our basic variant, which is called Ligero, and then the one that's very close to it and slightly below, which gives better communication, is Lijero strong. We make a conjecture about error correcting codes, and assuming this conjecture, we can actually reduce the cost by 25%. So, for instance, for the SHA certificate, I said 44 kilobytes was uh, with the Lijero system. With the Lijero strong system, we can bring it down to sort of 34 kilobytes. The, the blue line that's running across is sort of a comparison. We're just using the formula provided by the ZKB, and that shows how. Order C, like if you had a proof length that's order C, that's how it's going to uh, vary. The prover time, uh, again, this is a log log plot, and our prover time uh, scales well. Uh, I mean, I don't have anything more to say, uh, except that for even reasonable sizes, if you look at when does it go up to one second, is like when we go up to 100,000 gates. Okay, and with 100,000 gates, and when I say gates here in arithmetic circuits, and even in you can even incorporate integer computations on large strings if you use a very large finite field. And if you want, ask me more about how do we measure gates and what it means over here. The, the second thing I want to say is our multi-instance variant. The multi-instance variant uh, is that if you want to prove, again, several instances uh, of the same statement, think here I have two instances. One is sort of a 2,000 gate circuit, and the other is the SHA circuit. The SHA circuit is roughly 30,000 gates. At least the way we count it, it's roughly 30,000 gates. And we were able to execute it up to like 4,000 uh, instances. And what you see here is that the per instance cost uh, uh, decreases sharply with the number of instances. Uh, this is sort of the, the prover time and the verification time. As I pointed out, the benefit in the amortization, yes, we reduce the proof length per instance, but we also reduce the verification time. OK, so the verification time for uh, 5,000 uh, instances is not too off from verifying a single instance. The prover time, we cannot do it. 
if you were to extrapolate this graph, it is going to uh, grow up linearly because the prover has to compute the circuit for every instance. There is no way of reducing that. I want to point uh, about a, a follow-up work. I guess I'm already running out of time. We have a follow-up work that uses the zero-knowledge system that uh, where we actually can show, if you, if you were here yesterday for um, the talk which showed like a, a, very, a very good uh, two-party system, we, we show that using our approach, we can actually improve the communication cost over there, where they achieve sort of 6.3 megabytes for a typical benchmark over here, we are able to get roughly half the amount. Okay, and if you want to ask me more, come and ask me later. So let me just quickly put the last slide. In summary, what we get is a first concretely efficient zero knowledge. It's sublinear, no trusted setup, no public key uh, operations, no, com no complex PCP uh, machinery. And this is, that is just, I'm just trying to promote this work. Uh, if you want to take any cryptocurrency and you want to make it sort of anonymous, you can use this because it does not require trusted setup. You don't need any ceremonies to uh, initiate our uh, zero knowledge system. There is, of course, plenty of uh, work ongoing and future optimizations that uh, uh, are going on. You can come and ask me later uh, what's here. Thanks. So I have one question. You said you can repeat the number of uh, SHA evaluations. Does that work for a Merkle tree, or do you end up leaking the output at each? So one can generalize this. I didn't say. You can imagine that you have several instances of the SHA, as well as one global predicate on all that. And um, it will be the cost of each of these in the amortized sense, plus one instance of the global predicate. So if with the Merkle tree, um, the global predicate is simple. You just have to check the output of this as the input of this. And in our system, it'll, it won't cost anything additional. Cool. Like in, terms of, uh, in terms of communication, improve and verifier, it won't matter too much. But there is something additionally you will have to do. So the proofs stay the same size. Yeah. The proving time is going to be bad no matter what. Not and bad. Uh, well, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, and better than snark. Yeah. Uh, case, well, anyway. Yeah, cool. Hi, Julia Fonte from CMU. Uh, you talked about using Fourier transforms for the Reed Solomon encoding. Uh, is that Hadamard transforms or actual Fourier? So they are actual Fourier transforms. So if you know what secret sharing is and pack secret share, share packing are, it's basically taking these things and doing share packing, which is just polynomial evaluations. But when I say FFT here, it's FFT over a finite field. Most people from the ECE community would would think of complex numbers, but this is over a finite field. And if you want to know the concrete implementation we used was from NTL, uh, Victor Shoup's NTL library. OK. Um, and do you actually decode those encoded? So you're asking, do we need to do inverse FFT? So we have polynomial evaluation and interpolation. So secret sharing requires both, but they are exactly the same complexity because one is the opposite. Like you, FFT is the same as inverse FFT when it comes to uh, computation. Okay.